The guy who stopped WannaCry was arrested right after DEF CON, a vulnerability on older Amazon Echoes won't be patched, and hackers are using online repos to get developer creds. All that coming up now on ThreatWire. Greetings! I am Shannon Morse, and this is ThreatWire for August 8th, 2017. This is your summary of the threats to our security, privacy, and internet freedom. Real quick, make sure to subscribe and hit that little notification bell button to see the show as soon as it goes live, and check out patreon.com slash threatwire to see how you can support the show. Now, on to the news. Remember several weeks ago when WannaCry was creating a storm across the world and a hacker stopped the attack by registering a domain? That hacker was Marcus Hutchins, aka Malware Tech Blog or Malware Tech, on Twitter, who is a UK information security professional and is known for his work in software development and cybersecurity. Hutchins went to hacker summer camp like the rest of us and was arrested on US soil on Wednesday during his departure from DEF CON and Las Vegas. Now I want to preface this story by saying that there is a lot of false information about Hutchins being shared, and I will do my best to partake the most accurate information possible at the time of recording. If you find updates on this story, please leave links below in the comments, and I will make sure to pin the valid source material. If you are wondering where my info comes from, check the show notes. Now, Hutchins, who is 23 years old, was arrested and held in Nevada, a Nevada detention center, before being moved to a different facility the same day. Much of his friends and family had no contact nor information on where he was being held. According to the U.S. Department of Justice, Hutchins was arrested after a, quote, grand jury in the Eastern District of Wisconsin returned a six-count indictment against Hutchins for his role in creating and distributing the Kronos Baking Trojan. The charges against Hutchins and for which he was arrested relate to alleged conduct that occurred between in or around July 2014 and July 2015. Now, Kronos is a Trojan that, when installed, would allow an attacker to steal banking login details from victim computers using what is called a form grabber to steal that kind of data. Kronos was trying to be sold for 7,000 USD to buyers. Strangely enough, Kronos was released on July 1st, 2014, and Hutchins asked on Twitter for a sample of Kronos on July 13th, 13 days later. Hutchins does a lot of reverse engineering of malware to monitor botnet traffic, and that's basically his job. So why does the DOJ say that he had a role in the creation and distribution of Kronos? The indictment claims that Hutchins and another unnamed defendant were involved in trans transmitting the program, information, code, etc., and intentionally cause damage without authorization to 10 or more protected computers during that time period of 2014 to 2015. The DOJ also claims that they advertised the malware on forums, they sold it, and they received money for Kronos, and hid the acts of being involved with Kronos itself. The indictment also says Hutchins created Kronos, his co-defendant demonstrated how it worked on July 13th in a YouTube video, which which just so happens to be the same day Hutchins asked for a sample on Twitter, and the other defendant offered to sell it in August for $3,000 USD, and both parties updated Kronos in February of 2015. The second defendant advertised it on the dark web marketplace called Alpha Bay in 2015 and sold it for $2,000, then offered services related to Kronos in July of 2015. I should also mention Alpha Bay was recently shut down by feds a few weeks ago, and this ties into the sudden indictment. The indictment then specifies which titles of U.S. law the DOJ believes the two defendants would be found in violation of, including wiretapping and violating the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. He could spend up to 40 years in jail if convicted. Hutchins appeared in front of Judge Nancy Kopp on Friday as she set his bail. He spent the weekend in jail. As of Monday, Hutchins' bail was posted at $30,000 USD and supporters have raised over $12,000 USD as of Sunday. Updates to money raised are being posted Hosted by Tara Wheeler, an information security professional and a good friend of mine, at Tara on Twitter. She also has linked a funding campaign that others can donate for his legal fees, and she and a coworker of Hutchins are managing. The campaign is linked below, and Hutchins' coworker, Andrew Mabbitt, planned to pay his bail on Monday and hired defense lawyer Adrian Lobo. Lobo has denied the counts and said Hutchins will plead not guilty. On the other hand, prosecutor Dan Cowhig has stated Hutchins admitted he created the software. 
Since these two stories obviously don't match up, we will likely hear his formal plea by the end of day on Tuesday as he is set to appear in court in Wisconsin at that time. Now, during the court appearance on Friday, prosecutors explained that Hutchins was caught in a sting operation when cops bought the code. Prosecutor Cowhig also claimed evidence via chat logs of Hutchins expecting payment from his co-defendant for selling the code. A lawyer wanted Hutchins held on the fact that he went to a touristy gun range in Vegas, which honestly is so popular among DEF CON attendees, I'm even surprised they even tried to make that threatening. But luckily, Judge Cop disregarded that, allowing him bail. Hutchins cannot use the internet, must be monitored by GPS, and must surrender his passport while he's out on bail till his hearing, which happens on Tuesday. He's also not allowed to speak to the co-defendant. Now, according to IT security consultant Robin Edgar, Hutchins code was incorporated into the malware, but Hutchins had not done anything wrong and did not actually create the malware. Some reports have focused in on his ritzy vacation in Vegas during hacker summer camp, asking where he got all his money from and obviously creating a leading question about funding from Kronos, which Mabbitt rebutted with clarifications posted on Twitter. The whole indictment brings to light a serious problem with the bias hackers receive from general public and criminal justice officers and what should be considered illegal or legal activities. It is not illegal to download or create malware, but it is illegal to use it for malicious activities if the intent can be proven. But how do you prove that intent was there? And how do you prove that someone wrote a program or that just their code was used for a malicious actor to create malware? Currently, we do not have the full evidence in support or against Hutchins and his co-defendant, just an indictment and the current proceedings in U.S. court. We will keep you posted, though, as we learn more. Woo, that was a doozy. So let's talk about Amazon Echo. Yes, Amazon Echo devices sold in 2015 and 2016 can be exploited with a physical attack, allowing an attacker to listen in on users without any knowledge the device has been tampered with. According to Mark Barnes, a researcher at MWR Info Security, these models could be compromised by removing the bottom part of the speaker, exposing 18 debug pads, which could allow you to boot directly into firmware with an SD card. They could gain root access to the Linux operating system that Echo runs on and allow persistent remote access along with stealing authentication tokens and streaming live audio. You reattach the base, you leave the room, then the user would never know it was messed with. By doing so, Barnes says an attacker could listen in on the Echo's always listening microphone, which usually listens for a keyword until it wakes up and responds to the user. Now, if the user did press the mute button to turn off the mic, the exploit would not work till it was unmuted again. The newer models for this year do not allow for booting from SD card, so the hardware exploit no longer works on 2017 models. With older models, though, no firmware update will fix it, so they will be exploitable until they are no longer in use. Now, physical access is required to root and compromise these Amazon Echoes, and as such, most customers will probably not be affected. Amazon does recommend that customers buy from their website or a reliable retailer and not third-party or untrusted sources. A great example of this would probably be like eBay. Because of his research, Barnes stresses the need to consider physical attacks during development of hardware so future hardware prototype or loss in customer trust would not be an issue. Lastly for today, have you heard of typo squatting. This is where an attacker will use commonly misspelled names of repositories or even sites really to host malicious code in hopes of grabbing credentials from unsuspecting users. In this case, an attacker used typo squatting via the NPM online package repository used for JavaScript libraries, which are commonly used to call code functions for popular uses to host 40 different packages of code with just slightly misspelled names to gain developer credentials from anyone using these library packages in their code accidentally. Thus, if anyone calling these packages in code misspelled a word, they would be a victim of the attacker. NPM, which stands for Node Packet Manager, heard about the issue via a user on Twitter and immediately removed any packages linked to the same malicious code, which was tied to a user calling themselves Hack Task. The developer creds and other useful data would be uploaded to the attacker's server at npm.hacktask.net. And at this time, NPM is considering using programmatic detection tools to find and block packages from being publicized if they are found to be malicious and using typo squatting. 
thank you again to all the glorious, wonderful people who contribute to patreon.com slash threatwire. If you can spare a bit of change, it all helps keep Threatwire completely independent and ad-free. And if you're wondering where that Patreon money goes, it goes to things like this rent, the electricity, my own labor, and hopefully upgrading a new camera eventually. We now have an audio-only RSS feed, extra content, and early access for our patrons. We might even feature your adorable fur babies in an upcoming episode. They are so cute. Thank you again for sharing them. I love seeing your adorable fur babies. And remember, patrons, to share your favorite security-focused news stories in the Patreon community tab to get featured on the show. And of course, if you can't donate, you can hit that subscribe button, you can share this episode on social networks, and use the hashtag Hashtag Threatwire so we see it and we might even retweet you. With that, I'm Shannon Morse and I will see you on the internet.